Appreciate you all making it out tonight. It's been uh, crazy. The last, uh, I don't think we've been here since December 9th. It's been a while now. Um, we were going to have a couple weeks off anyway with holidays. And then uh, my mother's funeral and other things that came up. So uh, it's been a while. And if you've fallen behind on the reading, uh, I won't blame you. Uh, although maybe I will because I did send out an email yesterday or the day before. So uh, it was kind of a, a heads up warning that we are going to have class tonight and that you will be held accountable for having not read uh, chapter 7 and 8. So did you do the reading? Did you read chapter 7 and 8? Are you ready to discuss it tonight? I can grill you on anything imaginable. No. no? Actually, I expect tonight to be very quick. Um, these chapters are so dear to me, both chapter 7, dealing with truth, and chapter 8, dealing with exclusivity. Uh, I think we can teach these subjects in about five minutes, and then we can take about an hour or five hours uh, just expanding upon them uh, with much edification because of the culture we live in. This culture attacks truth. This uh, culture uh, actually is living. They hate exclusivity. And so because of that, we actually reap a lot of, um, a lot of uh, difficulties with uh, those who hate the Lord, with those who hate our uh, assurance of truth. So I'm going to open this up with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll uh, skim through these chapters. I'll highlight the things that jumped out at me that I highlighted and, uh, and then I'll throw it out to you and the things that you highlighted uh, and then maybe just open it up for some question and, and discussion and then uh, I'll give you your quiz because there is a quiz for tonight, the, the, uh, the uh, lesson four quiz. And, and by the way, I know for a fact, don't come to me and tell me that I didn't leave you enough room. No, I, I, I did not leave you enough room. Uh, what you have here are your writing assignments and you will need to use your own paper or your own email, all right? to uh, reply to these questions. If you try to squeeze your answer in in the little space between these questions, uh, that's not going to be sufficient. All right? So, uh, let's open in prayer. And that may actually help. We can lay hands on our projector and try to see if prayer might help. All right? Let's pray. Almighty Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you tonight for the privilege and blessing we have to assemble together. Father, uh, we've had a few weeks off now, so we're looking to you to, uh, to guide and direct our thinking. Father, to bring us back into, the, uh, into the, uh, the mode of thinking here related to systematic theology and, and uh, the blessings you provided for us through the text of, uh, of uh, Norman Geiser. We commit to our time tonight, Father, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. Open our text. Again, the reading assignment for this week is uh, chapter 7 and 8. Chapter 7 deals with truth, and chapter 8 deals with exclusivity. We're still in the prolegomena. Prolegomena is introduction. We're still laying the groundwork of things that are going to follow in the remainder of this, of this outline. All right. I'll give it one more try to uh, bring that up, and we'll see. Oh, that might be different. See? I should have prayed 10 minutes ago. All right. But truth is the epistemological precondition. And the problem is, is we live in a day and age in which Pontius Pilate is not the only one who throws up his hands and says, what is truth? All right. Practically speaking, everybody today is Pontius Pilate. Everybody today is denies that we have any capacity to understand truth or that there is such a thing as truth. There are no absolutes, and that's the world we live in, all right? And this whole aspect of epistemology, okay, uh, which is the, the study of, of knowing something. How do we know anything, right? How do we know what we know and do we? Okay, this, this by the way, this, this fills philosophy departments in, in university campuses all over the country. Uh, they, and postmodernism convinces their, their students that words don't mean anything. We can't really know anything anyway. And, and they, they, you spend all your time in college convincing yourself that you don't know anything or can't know anything. And it just flies in the face of experience. We do know what we know. That much we know, right? We, you can't talk us out of what we know. And we have a certainty about what we know. 
even if the adversary tries to muddy that or tries to diminish our certainty or tries to cast fear or doubt. That's the nature of, of the adversary. Okay? I expect a lot of my message tonight may even be simply, I may just you know, do a lot of preaching tonight on an on a exhortation basis. Because this goes back to the serpent with Eve. Where he says, indeed, did the Lord say? You know, do you really know what happens when you eat that fruit? How do you know? Is this what the Lord said? Indeed. Uh, can you trust him? I suspect he may be a liar. I suspect maybe he didn't tell you everything. All right? And so that's what we deal with. That's the, the spirit of this age, the spirit of Antichrist that's already at work in this, uh, in this age. So this is what we deal with here related to truth. And... Uh, definitions here. He actually walks you through six common but flawed definitions of truth. Six ways that the world will often describe truth. Each one of them is flawed. And one of the assignments you're going to have on your quiz is uh, guys will provide six common but flawed definitions of truth. Select one of them, any one, your choice. Select one of them and explain in your own words why that definition is flawed. Okay? And uh, you may pick it just based on uh, how you've encountered it. You may pick it based upon friends or family members or associates, people you know that hold to that position of truth. And uh, maybe it, it, it'll have a, a personal application for you as well in uh, being able to explain why that definition is flawed will be a fruitful uh, exercise. So truth is not that which works. Truth is not that which coheres. Truth is not that which was intended Truth is not that which is comprehensive. Truth is not that which is existentially relevant. Relevant, I'm sorry. Truth is not that which feels good. Okay, that may be the worst one, especially in our culture. No, truth is that which corresponds to its object. Truth is that which corresponds to its object. All right, and the correspondence definition of truth is older than Geisler, all right? He didn't make this up. This is, a, this is a definition that goes way back. This is fundamental, okay? In many respects, this is just as fundamental as the laws of identity and the laws of non-contradiction, the very laws of thought that go back to Aristotle, that go back to Western civilization. Truth is found in correspondence. Truth is what is. Truth is the reality, okay? And so... For people that want to attack that or deny that, you can have all sorts of fun with them. And I, and I recommend you have a, a gentle spirit about you as you do this. But if they want to deny truth, then that means they want to deny reality. All right? Because truth is that which corresponds with reality. And you ought to be able to boil things down. It won't take long. To, to boil things down in very simple terms as far as what is true, what is truth, what is reality, and, uh, and all the rest. Because much of it is properly basic. Much of it is properly understood in, in just common experience, how we live. We exist, right? I think, therefore I am. If, if, if I didn't exist, I couldn't have had that thought. Okay? In any event. I, I really don't want this whole class to become a philosophy lecture, but you can't escape some of it in, in just the, the fundamentals. Because if you don't accept all of these prerequisites... There really is not a point in advancing into the systematic theology. I mean, it just it's, it's groundless unless these prerequisites are all true. Fortunately, these prerequisites are all true. We do have a, a basis to move on. All right. So truth is found in correspondence. That is, truth is what corresponds to its object or its referent. And so and that could be a, an actual tangible thing or it could just be a, con a concept, an abstract. But nevertheless, there's a reality to the, uh, the referent. So, um, and by definition then, if that is an acceptable reference for truth, then we have also an acceptable reference for falsehood, for a lie. Okay? Because you understand that not only would you destroy truth with these bad approaches, you also destroy any aspect of falsehood, because nothing actually is false if nothing actually is true. <laughs> and boy, the devil would love to convince this world that nothing actually is false. Um, or that nothing is actually true. And that's kind of his stock in trade. He is the liar and the father of lies. Now, he approaches this in this chapter. I'm on page 114 now. Uh, with both philosophical arguments that I think are compelling and then ultimately biblical arguments that are compelling. 
And it's good to have both. I understand, I've, I've had conversations with folks here that, that some of you would, would, would rather let's just chuck all the philosophy, who cares, just stick with the biblical arguments for truth, and I'm fine with that, okay? And I can sympathize, I share that in a lot of respects. However, I think it's also fruitful uh, because we're, we're speaking amongst us in-house, you know, with like-minded believers, uh, that I think we all can agree that if, if it's revealed in the Bible and that's authoritative and we, we acknowledge that as coming from God and so forth. Um, however, in our apologetic ministry, in our evangelism, and in our uh, conversations with those that don't share the same uh, reverence for Scripture, then we actually will do ourselves some favors if we find non-biblical additional methods of argumentation. Uh, to where even you know, even if you're not saved, even if you're not don't believe the Bible, at least you can acknowledge that what is is and what isn't isn't, and, and the the elements uh, similar to how we discuss this in the in the laws of logic, in the laws of thought, uh, the laws of identity and non-contradiction, and in the the aspects there. At least uh, you don't have to be saved to accept that stuff. That's just common sense related to how you think. All right, different aspects there. Um, at the end of the day, though, it's kind of kind of fun. I, I find that most people, normal people, unless they are militant atheists that have drilled themselves in this kind of argumentation or this kind of approach, um, most normal people you meet at a Starbucks or on the street or wherever, they live in the real world, all right? And so it's not going to take long, and, and they'll agree with you that, that what is is and, and things that are are what they are, and they're not what they're not. And, and that there is a reality, all right? That there is an objective reality. And it's okay to go ahead and call that truth, all right? In, uh, in different realms. As we have time tonight, or perhaps our next fellowship opportunity will expand upon that. I'd, I'd actually be curious if uh, you have encountered folks that, that try to deny the existence of truth of any sort. And because uh, when they do so, they are making an affirmation. When they tell you that there is no such thing as truth, they expect you to accept that as a true statement. All right, and so you can, like I say, you can kind of have fun with them and say, "Well, really, does that include the statement you just made? Is that an absolute? Is that a true statement? If there is no truth, then that means your statement is neither true nor false. And why am I paying attention to it? <laughs> okay, because ultimately, isn't that what it's about? If it's true, if it's if it makes sense, then it's worthy of our uh, acknowledgement, our mental acceptance, and our thought. And if it's nonsensical then it can't be thought on. It can't be considered. It can't be, uh, it has neither a truth value nor a false value because it's nonsensical. And if that's how they want to live their lives, then say, all right, have a nice life. I'm not, uh, I'm not commanded by Scripture to straighten out your nonsensical approach. I'm commanded to give an answer for any who would ask. Okay? And if they want to know truth, I, I have truth. I'll give them whatever they want to know. Uh, but if they want to debate their nonsensical, ridiculous imaginations, the vain imaginations of man, I'm, I'm not called to, to dispute with that. Okay? We've discussed that in the past as well.